so we are recording. Um, one big announcement is I have decided to postpone the exam. It's not going to be Monday the 17th, but I have to postpone it to Friday the 21st. Only because I'm postponing the Tuesday-Thursday section, and they have to go first, so they're going to go Thursday, you're going to go Friday. Okay? So we are running a little bit slow, which is fine. Um, but just know that it is now Friday, February 21st. So if you look at our website, you can already see if you scroll all the way down, exam one has already been changed. You can see this right here, Friday, February 21st. Okay, so just so you know, just want to make sure. If you have any questions or concerns, just come talk to me right after class and we can work something out. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So last time what we were talking about was uh, the pump. I was talking about how the pump doesn't get any respect. We actually had some brain teasers, some top hat questions, really to uh, make sure that you realize how important the pump is. If you remember those top hat questions, I'll just refresh your memory. The pump, the sodium potassium ATPase actually plays a role in the membrane voltage. So if you block the pump, you'll depolarize the cell. It also has effects on cell volume. So if you block the pump, the cell will swell. And then also we talked about how it would have effects on pH, intracellular pH. So again, I will open up those top hat questions before exam one. You can review them, see the right answer, and if you have any questions. Uh, I, am, I always do this outside of class. I will try to have a formal review session so you can come with your questions right before exam uh, one. Okay? I'm probably going to be like Wednesday. All right, so uh, we've talked about the pump. Here is the questions. They are on the slide. Let's move on to another primary active transporter. In this case, this primary active transporter also uses ATP to move protons against their concentration gradient. These are F-type or V-type ATP aces. All right, they're actually really large proteins. F, by the way, stands for factor. You can see that at the top of the slide here. V stands for vesicle. Okay, so these primary active transporters, again, using ATP to move protons against their concentration gradient, are a lot of times used to change pH of a particular compartment, like a lysosome. All right, again, it's very large. You can see here there's two large multi subunit compartments. F0 is the transmembrane spanning domain or the, the integral protein, and it serves as the pore. And F1 is the peripheral protein. So, how does that look? Let's take a visual of that. Here you can see the F0 right here is the pore region. It is the integral component. It's the one that is in the plasma membrane. And then the F1 is the peripheral protein. And it's, it binds to the integral protein by the stock region. The F1 is actually the ATPase. It actually has the ATP binding site. So what usually happens with this ATPase is that it uses the energy that's released from the hydrolysis of ATP to move protons against their concentration gradient from low concentration to high concentration. Okay? But let's talk about a different scenario. It can work as either an ATPase to move protons against their concentration gradient or it can actually work as a synthase. And in this case, it actually uses the proton gradient to make ATP, which is really interesting to me. It works as an ATP synthase in mitochondria and chloroplasts. So how does that work? Let's take a look at that. This may bring back bad memories of biology 1009. 
okay. Just kidding. Just kidding. It's a great class. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, but what you'll notice here is, if you remember, the electron transport system. Remember oxidative phosphorylation? This is within the mitochondria. You can see the outer membrane here. Upper part here is giving you some idea of the mitochondria. Here's the outer membrane on the far right-hand side, and then you have this inner membrane right here within the mitochondria. With the electron transport system, what's actually happening is it's transporting protons, hydrogen ions, in this intermembrane space. It's setting up a proton gradient. Okay, that's really cool. And then these ATP synthase, it uses the proton gradient. Protons go down its concentration gradient. There's energy there to actually make ATP. And with the oxidative phosphorylation pathway, for every glucose molecule, it produces about 34 ATP molecules. That's highly efficient. Pretty cool. So in this case, it's running the ATPase backwards to make ATP. Okay. So one more, I think nutrition students might be very interested in this primary active transporter. This is another primary active transporter that's actually located in parietal cells in the stomach. So it is responsible for the secretion of stomach acid. After you eat a meal, your epithelial cells produce so much acid and transport it into the lumen of the stomach that your pH can get as low as 2 in the stomach right after you eat a meal. That is amazing. It is actually transporting hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid into your stomach. That's very close to battery acid when you think about it. pH of 1, pretty amazing. Okay, so this is the primary active transporter that's located in these parietal cells. These are epithelial cells that line the stomach. It uses ATP, the hydrolysis of, uh, hydrolysis of ATP, to pump protons into the stomach. And again, with every turn of the pump, it actually brings in two potassium into the interior of the cell. Proton potassium pump. Uh, chloride tends to follow this proton movement, and again, you are literally transporting hydrochloric acid into the stomach cavity. Okay, pretty cool, uh, pretty interesting. If you go to the store, we'll talk more about this when we get to the GI tract, but when you go to the store and you pick up like omeprazole or the purple pill called Nexium, right? That helps to reduce stomach acid if you have acid reflux, right? What it does is those drugs actually inhibit this pump, okay? So the, the uh, brand, uh, the generic name is omeprazole. You may have heard of that before. Again, we'll talk about this when we get to the GI tract. The important thing here is this is another example of the primary active transporter using the energy released from ATP hydrolysis to move other molecules against their concentration gradient. All right, if you need some text associated with it, here's another, uh, here's some more uh, text. Let's move on to um, these types of transporters. This is the last type of primary active transporters, actually called ABC primary active transporters. ABC stands for ATP binding cassette. So these are another example of primary active transporters. It does use the hydrolysis of ATP to pump other molecules against their concentration gradient from low concentration to high concentration. Um, I think the uh, one of the classic examples is the MDR transport protein. This is multi-drug resistance. Multi-drug resistance transport protein. 
and it transports many different drugs out of tumor cells or other types of cells. Uh, it does use the hydrolysis of ATP to do this. So one example of this is when scientists were really studying HIV, right? It's the virus that causes AIDS. They found out that this particular virus uh, actually has to convert um, RNA to DNA. And so they actually uh, found a, a target um, and a drug that would inhibit that process and hopefully cure AIDS, cure HIV and uh, the issues with HIV infection. Um, the drug was called AZT. I don't know if you've heard of that before, AZT. Uh, it was supposed to be the cure-all, but they didn't realize that these multi-drug resistant transport proteins were kicking AZT right out of the cell after they administered that drug. So it wasn't the cure-all that they thought it was going to be, but it is still part of the cocktail that they give for patients that actually have contracted HIV. So it's a good example. MDR is an ABC type ATPase. And then CFTR. We've talked about CFTR. Uh, CFTR is the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator. It's at the bottom of the slide here. It is a channel. It used to be a primary active transporter, and I hate to use this word, but it devolved into a, just a chloride channel. It still binds ATP. You have to have that binding of ATP in the hydrolysis to open the channel, but it doesn't move chloride against its concentration gradient. Now it's just considered an ion channel. So when it opens, uh, chloride will always go from high concentration to low concentration. It devolved into from a primary active transporter to an ion channel. It conducts both ions it, it, or many anions. It'll conduct chloride and bicarbonate. And the whole idea here is if this channel is not expressed, or I'm sorry, if there's a mutation of this channel and it doesn't get trafficked to the membrane, then it causes the disease cystic fibrosis. So I'll say that one more time. CFTR is a very important ion channel. If there is a mutation of the channel, the most common mutation is a delta F 508. It's the phenylalanine amino acid at the 508 position of this protein. If it's mutated, then this channel doesn't get inserted into the membrane and it causes cystic fibrosis. Okay, so these next series of slides, um, I'll show you where your homework assignment is. Um, I was in the lab right before the class and I didn't bring my printouts, but I'll show you where it is. You do have problem set number three that I'm going to roll out today. It is on our Canvas website. You can print it out. All I need is the question sheet. It's a case study on cystic fibrosis. Okay, I'll show you where that is in just a second. All right, so I did uh, have a former student who has two kids now. Uh, her oldest, she allowed me to actually show these um, these pictures of her son, his name is Spencer, and he is the most adorable kid. Uh, he does suffer from cystic fibrosis. Um, when he was a baby, this is one of the first things that they noticed. In addition to a, a blockage of his small intestines, because what happens is you can't get secretions, right, without that CFTR channel, and usually you get this mucus plug that occurs within the intestines when the, in, within the first few days of birth, okay? But later on, uh, my former student actually started noticing too that Spencer, um, he would get salt. You can actually see, if you look closely, you can see salt deposits in his hair from sweating at the top there where that circle is. She actually made that circle. Um, so usually what happens with sweat glands is your sweat glands reabsorb salt in the duct portion of the gland, and what you secrete is a hypoosmotic solution, right? You don't usually get salt in those secretions, 
but with cystic fibrosis, you can't reabsorb that salt without CFTR. And that salt ends up on his head or on his forehead. There's an old folk, folk tale. Um, these mainly are a lot of Norwegian, Swedish uh, descent actually suffer from cystic fibrosis. Um, basically, there's an old fol folklore that actually says if you kiss the forehead of a child and it's salty, it's kind of a bad sign. Okay, so um, basically, uh, my former student was actually documenting this. Okay, uh, this is Spencer, a little bit older, right? He's a little kid that has to have this vest. It's a vest that um, every day pretty much vibrates, right? And it kind of, it's, there's a lot of percussions. Um, it helps to loosen up the mucus in his lungs. And he has to do this on a regular basis. So this is my former student and, and Spencer. He's really adorable. But she is very adamant about educating people about cystic fibrosis. So um, with her permission, uh, I was allowed to, to show you all um, Spencer's story. So um, really, really wonderful kid. He's adorable. Um, but I just wanted to make sure you kind of have a face to a disease. Okay. So let me show you actually where... You free, and I'm sorry I didn't print it out. I usually like to do that so that you have it in class. Um, let's see here. So if we go to our web website and you scroll down, this is on our home page. Again, I just showed you that with exam one. Go right to the top here. Uh, this problem set isn't going to be due until Monday now, so you have a full week to do the cystic fibrosis case. It's called Woe to That Child. Woe to that child, it is just a case study. I'll open it up for you. The first part is just rolling out some of the symptoms. Oh, here's the Northern European folklore that I was talking about. You can go read through it. It's a doctor and patients that are talking about uh, cystic fibrosis and some of the symptoms. You only have to turn in this last page and it's just the questions. It's seven brief questions. And again, this will be for 10 points. You can expect maybe one or two questions on the exam related to cystic fibrosis. Remember, that is an ion channel, an anion channel, OK? All right. So let's now talk about secondary active transient. This shouldn't take too long. All right, so secondary active transport actually uses the gradient from one molecule, usually it's sodium. Usually because we know sodium is high on the outside and low on the inside, and that's very consistent. Many transporters use that sodium gradient, that energy from the sodium gradient, to move other molecules against their concentration gradient. Okay, so it usually binds sodium and another ion. This time it's in pink. The blue at the bottom here is the extracellular fluid. The brown at the top is the intracellular fluid. So it uses the sodium gradient, both sodium and another solute bind. There's a conformational change, and then sodium, in this case, and the other solute are delivered to the intracellular fluid using the sodium gradient to transport another molecule against its concentration gradient from low to high. Now here's some terminology for you. If the sodium and the solute are going in the same direction, these are called co-transporters or symporters. So for exam one, terminology is really important. So that's at the top here. This is the co-transporter. It's using the sodium gradient to move another solute against its concentration gradient in the same direction. Counter-transporters, they move molecules in opposite directions. So it uses the sodium gradient to move another molecule out of the cell against its concentration gradient in the opposite direction. That's called a counter-transporter or an anti-porter. You can see that at the bottom of the slide. I've also referred to it as an exchanger. 
counter transporters are the same thing as antiporters are the same thing as exchangers. I rolled out the sodium proton exchanger in the last top hat, set of top hat questions. All right, one thing I want to impress upon you as well is take a look at this. The transporter at the top is a primary active transporter. It's using the hydrolysis of ATP to establish a proton gradient, okay? A lot of times the primary active transporter and the secondary active transporter are coupled. So if you set up this proton gradient using the hydrolysis of ATP, then you can use the energy from the proton gradient to move other molecules against their concentration gradient. So many times these two primary and secondary active transporters are coupled. Just like when we were talking about the sodium potassium ATPase and the sodium proton exchanger. And remember, they play a role in regulating cell pH. All right, so this graph is just more of the same. It's just giving you some information. If we increase the sodium concentration gradient, remember that secondary active transporter is very dependent on that sodium concentration gradient. If we increase the gradient, we can actually increase the relative transport rate. So as you increase that sodium gradient, that energy associated with the sodium gradient, moving other molecules against their concentration gradient, as you increase the sodium gradient, you increase the transport rate. In this case, what's coupled is either the sodium glucose exchanger or the sodium amino acid exchanger. As you increase that sodium gradient, you increase the transport rate of both. There's some animations I'd like you to just take a look at when you get home. It's more of the same. It's just an animation giving you some information about co-transporters and anti-transporters. Some of the ones we've already talked about is the sodium proton exchanger. The sodium calcium exchanger is important in the heart. And then when we get to red blood cells, we'll talk about the chloride bicarbonate exchanger. Okay, so just some key players. Uh, two more terms that I think are important. When we talk about electro-neutral carriers, these actually transport uncharged molecules or an equal number of charged particles. They're actually very difficult to measure in the laboratory because you can imagine you can't really measure anything if they're transporting the equal numbers of charged particles. Electro-neutral. Let me give you an example that we already talked about. Remember our example of the Pro potassium proton pump in the stomach. It transports two protons and two potassium ions. This is what's known as electro-neutral exchange because there's no net transport of charge. <clears throat> electro-neutral. Okay, so going back, The other uh, term that I want you to know is electrogenic. I mentioned that before with the pump, the sodium potassium ATPase. That's why it plays a role in membrane voltage. For every turn of the sodium potassium ATPase, one net positive charge is removed from the cell. This is what's known as electrogenic carriers because there is a transfer, a net transfer of charge. And our last slide, just kind of an overview of all the different players in transport. We actually talked about simple diffusion. They don't even need a protein. We talked about facilitated diffusion with ion channels. We talked about gated, voltage-gated ion channels. We talked about mechanically gated, phosphorylated gated, and ligand gated. 
different ion channels. We also talked about carriers like the glucose transporter. And today we talked about primary and secondary active transport. Proton pumps, sodium potassium ATPase, calcium pumps, co-transporters, exchangers, right? All right, so let's move on. Active transporters. Now we're going to move into cell signaling. All right, cell signaling. So with cell signaling, I know this is a lot of information, but I want to reassure you that many, many of your others will be learning the same thing. So how many of you are familiar with G protein coupled receptors? You've seen it before in microbiology. You've probably seen it before in biochemistry, right? So this may be review for you, which is great. However, I can't assume that everyone has had G protein coupled receptors. So we have to go through this. Um, this will be important when we actually get to um, uh, the heart, okay? So again, here's our roadmap. We just finished with active transport mechanisms, primary and secondary. Let's now talk about signal transduction pathways. So receptors basically are proteins that are integral proteins. They're inserted into the plasma membrane. And chemical messengers, like ligands, bind to these proteins called receptors. So some chemical messengers are water soluble. They prefer to be in the aqueous environment. And their receptors are located on the plasma membrane. A lot of peptide hormones uh, are this particular example. They're um, hydrophilic. They prefer to be in the aqueous solution. They need a protein to cross the plasma membrane. And that receptor is usually located on the plasma membrane itself. But some messengers are steroids, right? Like we talked about with simple diffusion. They're lipid soluble or hydrophobic. And they can easily cross the plasma membrane into the nuclear membrane, across the nuclear membrane into the nucleus. A lot of times they actually um, initiate protein synthesis. Okay, so take a look at this one. I'm just going to ask the question. You can think about this for just a second. If I actually release a hormone and it bathes every single cell in your body, why are only some cells, why do only some cells respond? You can actually see from this figure the cell actually has to express the right receptor, right? So in this case, every single cell is exposed to that hormone, but only cell A is expressing the right receptor, and you get a cellular response. So today we're going to actually talk about G protein coupled receptors. They have seven transmembrane spanning domains. You can see these alpha helices. The amino acids kind of coil. They're called alpha helices, and there's seven of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Has an amino terminal end on the extracellular side and a carboxy terminal end on the intracellular side. Typical G protein receptor, I should say. Finish that off. G protein coupled receptor. Now, let's take a look at pathways that are initiated by these water soluble messengers. The first one, when a ligand or the first messenger binds to its receptor, it actually is an ion channel. So, ions, it opens up an ion channel, ions start to flow across the membrane, causes a change in membrane voltage. We're going to learn about this with muscle. The nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is a ion channel, a ligand gated ion channel. Or the receptor could be a kinase. The ligand binds to the receptor and it phosphorylates a docking protein that causes a cellular response. 
or instead of a uh, part as the kinase being part of the receptor, you can see it may bind to a kinase. And same thing, it could this kinase, JAK kinase, could phosphorylate other proteins, which then initiates a cellular response. But today, we're going to talk about D. We're going to concentrate on G protein coupled receptors. Okay? All right, so with that, I'm going to switch over to the document camera. I could actually go through this with you, but I feel like it's better for me to draw it out. So if you wanted to just get out a piece of paper, I think it's a little bit more fun if we do this together. I think I'll try to do this with a Sharpie so that you can see it better. All right. So the three different G proteins that you need to know are G, S, G, I, and G, Q. G, S, G, S protein coupled receptor. G, I, and G, Q. Luckily, G, S, and G, I are very similar. So I know this is a lot of information. I know that you might feel like this is a lot of memorization. Remember, this is going to be a multiple choice exam. You just need to recognize the players. Okay, you need to know the pathway, but just recognize the different players within the pathway. Okay, so let's start off with the GS. GS actually stands for stimulatory. GS. So. We have, we're going to start off with the plasma membrane. This is the outside, and here's the inside. And we have our G protein coupled receptor. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right? We have our ligand and our G proteins are going to be at rest. They're going to be connected to the receptor. Okay, we have a beta, we have a gamma, and we have alpha. The alpha is the one we're really interested in, the one on the end here. So. At rest, the alpha subunit actually has a GDP, guanine diphosphate, attached to it. Now, the typical uh, classic example of a GS coupled pathway is your fight or flight response. Okay, this is a sympathetic nervous system response where your ligand is actually norepinephrine. Used to be called adrenaline, right? You know what that does. It makes your heart race, right? It's kind of scary. It makes your heart race, your palms sweat, face might go white, start breathing heavy. That's a typical sympathetic response. This is all GS coupled. The receptor is a beta adrenergic receptor. Makes your heart rate, that's the beta one. Breathing rate increases, that's the beta two. Now it's more important to memorize the pathway than it is these ligands and receptors. This will come, you'll relearn this when we get to the heart. All right, so at rest, here's our setup, right? Norepinephrine binds to the receptor. Norepinephrine binds to the receptor. The alpha subunit exchanges GDP for GTP. 
okay? Now, the alpha subunit is actually a GTP ace. It's going to break down GTP eventually, okay? But it's like a timer. It's like a kitchen timer that you would set when you're cooking. Think about it when GTP now is the alpha subunit is activated and it exchanged GDP for GTP. Timer is set. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Now, now the alpha subunit can dissociate from the beta and gamma and it's going to migrate over to another protein called adenylyl cyclase. This is an enzyme, adenylyl cyclase. Our alpha subunit with its GTP attached, still hasn't broken it down yet, is now associating with adenylyl cyclase. Timer's still running, tick tock, tick tock. At this time, adenylyl cyclase is now activated by the alpha subunit with the GTP attached to it. Adenylyl cyclase activity goes up, and what it does is it actually converts ATP to cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is known as the second messenger and it really goes up within the cell. The ligand norepinephrine is the first messenger. Cyclic AMP is known as the second messenger. So, let me clarify though, adenylocyclase without the alpha subunit does still make ATP within the cell. There's a basal rate. However, once the alpha subunit with GTP is attached, it really increases its activity and cyclic AMP really goes up in the cell. Now, cyclic AMP also goes on to activate another protein called PKA, or protein kinase A. And now that goes on to phosphorylate, oops, phosphorylate a bunch of other molecules. There's a true amplification. Adenyl cyclase makes cyclic AMP. Each cyclic AMP molecule activates a number of different protein kinase A molecules, and it really amplifies the response. Okay, so that's a typical GS response. Now, let me finish the story. Eventually, the alpha subunit, which is a GTPase, hydrolyzes GDTP, GTP back to GDP. So then once GTP is hydrolyzed to GDP, now the timer stops. And alpha subunit migrates back over to the beta gamma. And now it has the GDP attached to it, like a timer. Any questions so far about the GS-coupled receptor? GS-protein-coupled receptor. Yeah, question? Is the question from the gamma going to be able to identify? Yeah, yeah. So um, I would say this. Uh, just a general question would be, uh, you haven't learned about GQ yet, but if you uh, notice that you're given a, a certain drug and cyclic AMP goes up in the cell, it's a pretty good chance that that's a GS-coupled receptor that's been activated, right? So you have to know the pathway and all the players, but you don't have to draw it out or memorize it. And it's, again, multiple choice. Okay? Yeah. All right. So let's go ahead and do GI. Okay? GI, here's the same plasma membrane. All the players are the same, kind of. We've got adenylocyclase. We've got a 
seven transmembrane spanning domain, but this is definitely not the same. This is a GI, GI coupled. And in fact, the G proteins are GI specific, GI beta, GI gamma, and GI alpha, beta, gamma, and alpha. And the alpha, remember this is GI specific, has a GDP attached at rest. Okay. And before it's even activated, as I said before, adenyl L-cyclase does has uh, has a basal rate. It is actually producing cyclic AMP at a normal basal rate. The classic example of GI is Ligand is called is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine. And the receptor is the M2 muscarinic receptors. Again, this isn't as important as the pathway itself, but we will revisit this when we get to the heart. Here's the take home message if you wonder why we're going through all this trouble. This is part of the parasympathetic. If the sympathetic, the fight or flight, makes your heart race, the parasympathetic actually slows your heart down quite a bit. It's because they're very similar pathways. You'll see why. You may not know this, I think this is an interesting fact, but you can trigger a parasympathetic response if you're a scuba diver. If you're a diver and you just stick your face in the water, especially cold water, and you can do this in the laboratory too, just put your face in uh, ice water, it will trigger a profound bradycardia, a parasympathetic response that slows your heart. I actually don't do this in the physiology lab because I'm worried that people will faint, right? I can't. I can't risk somebody fainting and falling over on the floor. But that will trigger a parasympathetic response that will slow your heart rate. So why does that happen? You, got, you know the story already. Acetylcholine binds to its receptor, M2 muscarinic receptor. There's a conformational change. The alpha subunit exchanges GDP for GTP. Now the clock is ticking. Tick tock, tick tock. The alpha subunit migrates over to adenyl cyclase. Alpha subunit has a G GTP at this time attached to it. GTP hasn't been hydrolyzed yet. But in this case, when it actually associates with adenylocyclase, what it does is it decreases its activity. It inhibits it. That's why I, inhibitory. <coughs> what happens is cyclic AMP falls within the cell. It causes a decrease in protein kinase A activity. And you can see how it shuts everything down. So there's no extra memorization here. Players are all the same. Let me finish up the story. Eventually, alpha subunit is going to hydrolyze GTP back to GDP. Timer stopped. Alpha subunit migrates back over to the beta gamma, and now it's back at rest. Pretty good? All right, so we just have a few minutes. Here's the last one, and then we're done for today. We're going to do the GQ coupled receptor. GQ, here is our plasma membrane. Here is our seven transmembrane spanning domain. One, two, three, four, five. Three, four, five, six, seven. There we go. Classic example of a GQ coupled receptor is, may or may not know this, but UTP. It's a 
it's uh, closely associated with ATP. You may not know that ATP and UTP are signaling molecules. They can activate cells in different ways. These receptors are called purinergic receptors. These are GQ, make, make sure that everybody knows, GQ coupled receptors, beta, gamma, alpha. These are GQ-specific beta, GQ-specific gamma, GQ-specific alpha. At rest, again, has a GDP associated with it. However, these are new. This is PLC beta, phospholipase C beta. I'll write that up at the top, phospholipase C, beta. It's an enzyme. Now get this. You have these phospho-tidal inositol, phospholipids, that make up the plasma membrane, right? These phospholipids, one of them is called PIP2. PIP2. PIP2 actually stands for phospho-tidal inositol 4,5-bisphosphate. Again, do not memorize that. This is not going to be an essay or fill in the blank. Just recognize it. You'll, you'll, uh, on any question, it'll say phospho-tidal inositol 4,5-bisphosphate in parentheses PIP2. Okay, that's these phospholipids in the membrane, and PLC beta converts PIP2 to two enzymes, DAG and IP3. DAG is actually a membrane bound, it's called diacylglycerol. And I'm going to put DAG right here. DAG actually goes on to activate PKC. That's another protein kinase that's activated. IP3 is an enzyme that has receptors. This is what's the cool part. This is the smooth ER, endoplasmic reticulum. And there's a ton of calcium that's being sequestered, right? It's actually inside this compartment, just ready to go, ready to be released. Calcium 2 plus. IP3 binds to its receptor on the smooth ER, and calcium starts to be released into the intracellular space. What's cool about this? is that the IP3 receptors are actually sensitive to calcium. So when calcium is released, it triggers the IP3 receptors to release more calcium. This is a positive feedback mechanism. Calcium release, calcium induced, right? It's a way to amplify the calcium response so calcium really goes up in the intracellular space. Calcium is the second messenger. And then you have a primary active transporter that uses ATP to resequester re the calcium after the response. Oh my gosh, we are over. All right, I got to let you go. We'll review this on uh, Wednesday. Wednesday. Don't forget the... The first exam is now on Friday, Next and I Friday. will announce the uh, review session sometime Next this week. Friday, right? Oh, not this Friday. Next Friday. Sorry, don't didn't mean to scare you. Oh, they can take not these. Not this Friday. Okay. What's that? Whoever okay. submitted this oh, can take it back. Whoever actually just turned in their problem set number two, you can come up and pick those up. Megna already put those into the grade book. Again, if you 
We're in lab. Please come up and get Tia's feedback. Have a good Tuesday. See you Wednesday. Hi, good question. Sure. In the in our it says the second messengers are those, but you said calcium. So oh. I was just wondering. So calcium is the second messenger, okay. but these are basically the uh, molecules that are going to trigger the calcium. Okay. okay. So okay. technically, the second messenger should be really Yeah, awesome. I see. I see. Uh, I would say calcium is the second messenger. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. Hi. Yes. Did you email it to me? Okay, I will get to that. That's totally on me. No, no, no. Um, oh, okay. I have it. Like, I didn't bring it from the manufacturer. Okay. Um, you didn't bring it from the last. No, I forgot to.